This may be, oh no, yeah, it's, uh, it's ringing a little bit. You may want to bring it down just a tad. Or a Ted, or Frank, or Paul, or something. Okay, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll get going and see how quickly we get done, or how long it takes. And we'll dig into Nehemiah. Lord, thank you for tonight, and thank you for all that you've, you've done in our lives, and Lord, even today. And Father, I pray that as we look into your word tonight, that you will give us eyes to see, and that you will reveal from your word things that we have never seen before, things that are precious, things that will change our life, things about your character and in your attributes and you just your passion for your people. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you here and we ask you to teach us tonight. May you be glorified. And we love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Y'all bear with me. I ate at a restaurant last night with my son and something just tore my stomach up and has been just terrible since last night. So um, I'm pretty drained, but we're going to get into it. Let's see if the word can revive tonight. Okay, tonight we're looking at Nehemiah, or as we used to say many years ago, Nehemiah. Yeah, Nehemiah. So um, it's in, the, in our scriptures, in our, you know, in our Bible, in, our, in the canon here, we, you know, it comes right after Ezra. And Nehemiah, we'll see tonight, was, um, was King Artaxerxes' cupbearer in Persia. His name only appears in this book. Nowhere else in the Bible will you see the name Nehemiah, except for in the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is interesting because it's really neat. And I, I firmly believe that in God's sovereignty and God's wisdom and in God's humor, I think sometimes, he allows certain people to write certain things because Nehemiah's name means Jehovah comforts. And that's really a lot of what we're going to see tonight. You know, so it's interesting that this book is named after a man that really the message is we're going to look, you know, it, it should bring comfort to God's people. God worked through Nehemiah as a key participant in the reestablishment of the Jewish nation in the promised land after the exile. So here we are. We're right about here, about four, uh, 445 B.C. And this is where Nehemiah makes his entrance. And it was right at the end of the actual, you know, uh, returning after the exile in Babylon. Now the title... In Hebrew, as we've been seeing, as we've been going from Genesis all the way through, that in the Hebrew scriptures, the title is just the first couple of words of the, of the book itself. And so the Hebrew title is the words of Nehemiah. Okay, this is the title, Hebrew title for the book of Nehemiah. Now, in the Greek Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate, which is the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament or the Latin translation, which is done by the Catholic Church, you know, of the Old Testament, is called Second Ezra. You know, or second Ezradas. Okay, it was considered by the translators of the Septuagint to follow the book of Ezra. Later, the translators adjusted the titles, or the title according to the current belief, which is the book of Nehemiah. So, the author, you think it's Nehemiah? No, it's actually from what most believe, and I tend to believe it this way, is Ezra. Much of this book will draw from Nehemiah's personal memoirs, but although these reports were written in the first person, like in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through chapter 7, verse 5, and then in chapter 12, verses 27 through 43, is all in the first person. Chapter 13, verses 4 through 31, are all in the first person. Both Jewish and Christian traditions have long held that Ezra is the author. Now, there's three key clues that we can, be, we can see that will um, show us that most likely Ezra is the author. 
The two books, Ezra and Nehemiah, were originally one book, indicated in the Greek Septuagint and the Latin Vulgate. And also in the, in the Hebrew scriptures way back, they were one book, and they follow right after one another. The recurring phrase, hand of the Lord, in both uh, books points to a single author. The sources used, you know, uh, official Pers Persian documents probably included Nehemiah's reports and were available to Ezra. Remember we saw last week that Ezra used some um, writings from the king, uh, king of Persia, from Cyrus, from all these different ones about, you know, when he wrote the book of Ezra and most likely got those reports also, things that, that uh, Nehemiah had written and used that and put the book together. So uh, personally, just my, my interpretation of it all, I believe that, that Ezra is the writer of Nehemiah. Okay, we good so far? Okay. Now the date is somewhere between 424 and 400 BC. You know, it's the date that's generally given for Nehemiah's arrival is 444. We saw, or 445, somewhere in here, when his arrival, when he came, when the third wave going back to the promised land, back to Jerusalem, came and Nehemiah led it, it's probably around that time. So somewhere between, after, right after that, probably around in here, the book of Ezra, or book of Nehemiah was written. Now there's some key people in Nehemiah. Nehemiah for one. If you want to look at it, you can read it you know, later on. The first 13 chapters, you can see that who he was. He was a cupbearer for the king. He petitioned the king to, to allow him to go back and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem because they were devastated and there was no protection for the city. So Nehemiah said, I want to go back. Because remember, what was Ezra going back for? Anybody remember? From last week? Hmm? What did he head back for? The temple. Okay? So he went back to rebuild the temple. And in between there, between this time, 458 to 445, Nehemiah says, I want to go back. We need to put the walls up because... If you read, there's different uh, uh, other nations that are, that are mocking, that want to you know, attack or saying that they're going to attack or they're never going to get the walls done and that you know, other people are going to get in. And they went, no. Nehemiah goes, nope, we're going to keep going. So Nehemiah is a very influential person, of course, because it bears his name. Ezra, as we saw, that led the second group of exiles back to Jerusalem. He worked with Nehemiah as Israel's priest and scribe because later on we're going to see that Nehemiah becomes the governor over uh, Jerusalem and in that area. Ezra is his priest in the temple that sets everything back in order. It is, I don't know about you, but it's, it's really interesting because it's been a long time since I've put this all back together again because we had to do it in Bible college, you know, in my undergrad. And it's interesting going, wow. You know, like take for instance, we're going to see as we get, in, get into, not next week, but the week after, Esther was written in between here. Her story happened in here, in between the first and second return to Jerusalem. Malachi was prophesying in between here, in between, this, you know, in between the, the uh, second and third and after the third. And later on, we're going to see you know, where others fit in, where the different um, uh, prophets came in, where Isaiah came in, and, where, and it's going to see a timeline because basically... And I hate, oh, I hate that word. And I don't like the word hate either, but um, you're going to see tonight that this is where it all stops until Jesus shows up. And when we're all done, hopefully we'll have a big timeline to look at and go, wow, yeah, that's where Ezekiel and Daniel, and oh, yeah, he was going in here. And you're going to see all these different prophets, how they overlap with each other, you know, with the certain kings. Now, uh, Sambalot was the governor of Samaria who attempted to discourage, he's another person in, in the book of Nehemiah, to discourage the people and thwart the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. But uh, from chapter 2, verse 10, all the way through chapter 13, verse 28. And Tobiah, who is the Ammonite official who mocked the rebuilding of the wall and discouraged the people the same time during Sambal, uh, Sambalot, during that chapter 2 through chapter 13. Now, 
Here's some background. And then we're going to get into, as we get into you know, some more stuff here, we're going to actually t- get into a couple of chapters of Nehemiah tonight. The opening scenes occur in Persia. The history, you know, was, was this. We, see that we saw where the, the United Kingdom, not talking about England, okay, was it split and it went into two kingdoms, the north and the south. 722, Assyria came in and God prophesied, and we're going to see that as we look at some of the other prophets, prophesied that the northern kingdom was going to get annihilated, and it really did. It wiped out the northern kingdom. Ten tribes got assimilated into the nations, and that's where you ever heard the lost tribes of Israel? That's right there. Okay? And then later on, because God was keeping this line of Judah where the Messiah was going to come from, he kept it going until what? Until 586, there was, you know, Babylon came in around 605 and started doing deportations to Babylon. And 586 was the last deportation into Babylon, and they were kept for 70 years. 67, 70 years, depending on how things, how you look at things. But God even said for 70 years, they're going to be in captivity. And then in 538, Zerubbabel takes the first group back, then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. So this is the history that is the foundation for the book of Nehemiah. Now, the following years, you know, saw the Persian, Persian Empire start to rise during here because Babylon gets sacked right about here, and then the Persian Empire begins to, to happen. And they came in, they sacked Babylon, and they, they start taking over, and that's what we're looking at here. This is the Persian Empire. Does that make sense so far? Okay. And we got King Cyrus eventually set in motion the events leading to the Jews' return to Jerusalem. Ezra, Esther, Daniel, Nehemiah, and Malachi provide the details for these years in the history of God's faithfulness. The last two books share the distinction of being the final records in the Old Testament. By the close of Nehemiah, God has allowed his people to reestablish a foothold in the promised land. But here's the interesting part. After this right here, there's 400 years of silence when there was no word from God. Now, you may ask me, you're going, what about the Apocrypha? You know, what about, you know, uh, the writings of the Maccabees? I do not believe they were God speaking. I believe it was people. I don't believe it's the word of God. I never have. Historically, but it's not, there's, this 400 years of silence is talking about God speaking to his people. Not about man writing historical documents. There was plenty of documents that happened here, but they were not God speaking. God stopped for 400 years. Didn't mean he pulled himself from anybody. His love was there. Everything was finalized because there was a purpose for that. And we will see that when we get to the end. But again, you know, what... When God's revelation again takes written form, God will also have taken on flesh and blood. Because what happened was, remember I told you, the last Old Testament prophet is John the Baptist. He was, at the last verses of the Old Testament in Malachi, says that God's going to send Elijah, and he's going to announce the king. Because see, what was the whole purpose of this? They were waiting for their king. They got their city back, they rebuilt the temple, which eventually became, as we call Herod's temple later on. And what happened was, is here, is that they were still waiting for the king. And it was all said and done. So for 400 years, they were waiting. And they were waiting as they waited through here. Because after the, after the sack of Jerusalem, there was not another king. Because the ultimate king was who? Christ. And when he showed up, remember what was the last thing Pilate said to him? One of the last things. He said, are you the king of the Jews? What did Jesus answer? You say that I am. Which is him saying, yes. So the king arrives. We all good? Y'all are quiet tonight. If y'all are quiet, we're going to get done with this real quick and you can go home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love my Mary because she will throw something out and she, it's like a bait. She's going, will you take it? <laughs> 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 it, 
And that's a compliment, sweetie. That's a compliment. I was telling somebody that the other day. I love having you in here. Okay, the theme is this. Jerusalem is God, as the city of God's people. That's the theme of this whole, this whole book, I believe, and many others. Nehemiah is concerned chiefly with the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem and the structural and political integrity of the city. The city of Jerusalem itself is of primary importance in this book and should be seen as, a, as symbolic of God's order and rule in the world. The city is an important image for the prophets as well, including Ezekiel and John. In the case of all the, uh, these writers, Jerusalem is seen as both the symbol of God's people as, and also as the mystical bride of Christ because what happens the New Jerusalem in Revelation comes down, right? Okay? So it's that mystical bride of Christ. And so the whole point of it is Nehemiah wanted to build the wall and get the city back in shape because he believed it was the city of God's people. Now the purpose of the writing is this. Nehemiah describes the building of the city walls as a signal of the rebirth of Jerusalem as a legitimate city once again. And together with Ezra, this book records the restoration of the city as a center of the Jewish nation because Ezra went back to get the temple in order. He gets the temple going, and then most likely at the same time, and it was probably still going on, that Nehemiah starts building the walls. So Jerusalem is getting rebuilt, and it's getting built literally almost from the ground up. There was one point in the scriptures in the book of Nehemiah where it says they brought the two walls together, but it was only half the, the height, but they finally brought the two walls together, which means there was a wall all the way around Jerusalem. What's interesting is that when we went over there, you know, as I was reading through this, I'm going, wow, I remember, you know, those walls. You know, and they're still from when Rome came in in 70 A.D. and sacked Jerusalem and, and just destroyed the walls. There's still the stones from those walls that were pushed over, which I can't even believe how they did that. Hmm? No, but there's still, there's still stones from the wall. Well, there's actually, a, there is a wall because there's an interest and there's gates, there's sections of it because there's certain gates that are still around except for the eastern gate is still there but it's all, it's all stoned up, okay, and they can't get in there plus, plus uh, they put a graveyard in front of it because so, they knew Jews wouldn't go through, they know the Messiah wouldn't step over that being a Jew or put his foot on a, on a grave site. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> hmm? Yes. Yeah, because they know that Jesus was a Jew, and a Jew will not step on a, on a, grave, a grave site, especially of Muslims. And it's a Muslim grave site, and it's right in front of the eastern gate where Jesus is going to go through when he returns. So and when, when they say, well, we don't believe that Jesus you know, is God, then why did you do what you did? <laughs> why did you do what you did then, huh? Okay, so, but the walls are really neat because it, they're, they're beautiful. It's an incredible, incredible place. And there's something, I, I don't care who you are, there's something very holy about that city when you're there. Something very holy about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It all went up together. Because think about it. Why did he become governor? Why did they make him governor? Because of his organizational skills. If you really look at it, Nehemiah is an incredible book on leadership and how he orchestrated certain things for the people, like Walker said. That's a neat, neat. Anybody else see anything? Anybody remember that? Or remember anything else about Nehemiah? I encourage you tonight, you know, for the rest of the week, I would encourage you to read the book. It's what, 10, 12 chapters, 14, something like that. I can't remember. I'm terrible at that kind of stuff. Let's look at it. 11, 12, 13. Yeah, 13 chapters. Read it. And you will see some really, really neat things. And they're not long chapters. It's a very short book. And most of you can probably, before you go to bed tonight, read the majority of it. 
And probably what will happen is you'll get into it, and then you, I want to finish this. You know, and so you'll stay up and read the whole thing. Here's a quick survey of it, okay? Um, the book of Nehemiah displays the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and the revival of the people. The wall of the city of Jerusalem is its protection against foreign attack. Now, but consider this. Turn me to Ze Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. Look what Zechariah said. It says, But I will camp around my house because of an army, because of him who passes by and returns, and no oppressor will pass over them anymore. For now I have seen with my eyes. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, he is just and endowed with salvation. Humble and what is this? Mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off. And he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, Israel still awaited the coming king, if you really think about it. Zechariah prophesied about it, which is during this time. And he saw, prophesied and saw the king coming in on donkey. Who did that? Jesus. So again, after those 400 years of silence, Jesus is born. The king is born. And all this stuff gets fulfilled that we've been seeing. Questions? It's just the way God planned it. You know, some would say it's just a long extension, like 40 years in the wilderness, okay? Um, 40 days was considered the, the ultimate fast. So a day is as a year, you know, possibly. I believe that. In Galatians it says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. So 400 years can be, like you said, that could be true because it wasn't long after this, a couple hundred years where Rome started to step in and Rome took over the world and the Persian Empire fell and it was gone as, we, as they knew it and Rome took over. Rome sacks, you know, you know, or takes over Jerusalem, doesn't sack it, but starts to take over it. Then later on, he sack, they sack it in 70 A.D. But all the roads were in, in place. Why? Because when the Messiah came, guess what happened? The disciples went out and started to evangelize the world. And they used Rome's roads to get there. Rome's ships, you know, the, the ports, all these different things to do it. So, yeah, I would tend to agree with, with Mary on that. Absolutely. Plus, it, there's a lot going on in these years up to 400. Mm-hmm. Yes, he did during those 400 years. No, they didn't. A place in the canon, which means a place in the, in the scriptures you know, for Nehemiah. Historically, Nehemiah, again, captures the rest of the record of the return to Jerusalem, which was begun by Ezra. Theologically, Nehemiah emphasizes God's movement upon the human rulers of the world to accomplish his purposes, which is really, really neat. Because all the way from Artaxerxes to Cyrus, you know, God moved and gave favor to these three here to be able to, to go back to Jerusalem. That's why when, you know, you, especially in the charismatic world, and it kind of started and then it's kind of moved over all around, 
you know, denominations, you know, you know, favor in Jesus' name. May God give you favor at work. May God give you, and it's true, because it says in the scriptures that God, you know, raises up and he puts down. He exalts and he dethrones. And so all through this, God moved on these rulers, these and technically heathen rulers that didn't really believe in him, that weren't going to believe him, but he gave favor to God's people. When before, back in Egypt, they had no favor, if you really think about it. Because God even hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's heart was already hard, and he wasn't going to do it. But God said, fine, I'll really harden it. And why did he do that? To show that he can deliver his people. And then as they go along, and as Babylon sacks them, and they're in there for 70 years, God lets Persia come in, wipe out Babylon, take over all that area, inherit his people, and then set his people free. That's amazing to me. But now let me ask you a question. How would you think if you were his people in, during that time? How would you be feeling? Pretty what? Yeah. Were you ever discouraged in, your, you know, in a situation in your, uh, your life that you walked through and then at the very end of it you could look back and you saw how God orchestrated each event but you couldn't see it at the moment? <laughs> okay. Because, yeah, okay, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Turn with me, Nehemiah chapter 8. Well, actually, I want us to look at something. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. Let me see if I can find that one passage. Uh, yeah, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's just start in the beginning. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Halkiah or Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hananiah, son of, uh, one of the brothers and some of the men from Judah came and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity in about Jerusalem. Yeah, I wanted to bring that up too. I'm glad I read this. That there were still people in Jerusalem. You know, Babylon didn't deport everyone. In fact, Babylon, because we're going to see later on as we look at Daniel, they deported at first all the choice leaders, all the choice people, all the, all the rich people, all the leaders, all the, the influential people. And then they started taking anybody else. But there were still many who didn't get taken off because they went and hid, they ran, they escaped. And so there were still people living in Jerusalem when Zerubbabel took the first group back, then Ezra took the second group, and then Nehemiah took the third group. There were still people there. It wasn't completely desolate in the sense that there was no inhabitants, but the majority of them were all deported to Babylon. And watch this, verse three. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. What a great, great passage. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to, the, to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night. And on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. We have, excuse me, acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though those of you um, <clears throat> who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heaven, heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. Which is where? Jerusalem. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today, favor, 
and grant him compassion before this man. It came about in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had, um, now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why is your face and though you, uh, why is your face sad though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. And I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long uh, will your journey be, and when will, uh, when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. I think he went back to Persia, if I'm correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think eventually the king let him go back to stay, but he did make mm -hmm. it. I believe it does. It goes on in verse eight, uh, 18, he says, I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me. Now, now, there's a purpose for me wanting to bring this up before we get into this next section. I'm praying, and I pray this for myself quite often, that I will recognize things that I normally wouldn't recognize as God's favor. Because many times we look at it as, and it's, Christians do it all the time, coincidence, or it just happened, or, you know, or we say kind of, well, praise God, but we're not really seeing it as God working something. And when we do start recognizing those things, then the eyes of our hearts are going to be open, and we're going to start seeing things more and more. I mean, you know, I, I know I say things about Denise all the time, but she cracks me up because over the years, she even thanks God if she gets a parking spot up front. And she really means it. She'll drive through a parking lot and go, Lord, can I park up front? We, we open it. And just about like 99% of the time, you know, me, I, I'll park all the way out on the back 40, so I have to walk, Okay. But she'll pray for God to give her, and he, like, does. Now, most people go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, great. It just happened. A person pulled out, and you were driving. Like, no. And that's what he was doing, because if you really think about it, there was no other reason for him to, uh, to really think that. You know, like, take, take, for instance, he said, Lord, open it up, and no, and then it does happen. But he could have said, well, you know, it just kind of happened instead of giving God the glory for it. We've got to learn to, if God is so majestic and we believe he is to start giving glory for those things that are good that happen in our life and recognize that it's the favor of God on us. Am I making sense? Okay. Now here we go. Chapter 8. Turn to chapter 8. Now with all that in mind, watch this. This is really cool. Look at verse 1, chapter 8. And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And there's a gate called, you know, the water gate. And they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Now let me back up. In 2 Kings, I believe, chapter 22, Josiah and the priest during that time they found the book of the law in the temple and they brought it back and they read it and it brought the people back to God. Now, this is a very similar occurrence here where Ezra, you know, they ask Ezra to go get the law and bring it in 
And then Ezra, look at verse 2. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. That was probably somewhere between 7 o'clock to noon. I mean, imagine standing there like this and listening to somebody go and read. In the sun, outside. We don't have that kind of dedication anymore, I don't think. Verse 3, and he read from it before the square, which is in front of the water gate from early morning to midday, in the presence of men and women and those who could understand, and all the people who were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood at the wooden podium, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mathath, uh, I can't even say that name. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Messiah uh, on his right hand, and all these other guys on his left hand. <laughs> Verse 5. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord a great God, and all the people answered amen and amen while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, uh, Shabbatiah, Hodiah, that other guy, Kalida, Azariah, Joseph Bad, he was a bad guy, Hannah, Peliah, the Levites explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You ever heard that scripture? That's where it comes from. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Then on the second day, the heads of the fathers, household of all the people, the priests and Levites, were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. Remember when we studied the feast? The feast of booths, the feast of tabernacles. So what are we seeing here so far? What's happening? Very true. That's exactly what it is. Because they didn't even remember about the Feast of Tabernacles, the feast. They had no idea. It had been so foreign to them for so long. There was a generation that came up and knew nothing about it. But when they heard the word of God, they began to weep. And then Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites did something very non-millennial. <laughs> you know what they said? Quit crying. They said, quit crying. Stop. Stop. This is a joyous time. Don't cry. You know? But nowadays you get, if you get upset, you know, you're, not, you're not supposed to tell people that, but you know, stop it. No, this is a joyous time because God has given us favor. God has brought, and they began to translate the law to them. They began to teach them. The spiritual revival came when, as they were reading the book of the law, verse 1. After reading, Ezra and some of the priests carefully explained its meaning to the people in attendance, verse 8. The next day, Ezra met with some of the fathers of the households, the priests and the Levites, in order to understand the words of the law, verse 13, which means what? They taught what they understood. Ezra got the, the fathers, the Levites, and all the people, and Ezra being a, 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 you know, a priest 
and a, and a, and a, uh, a scribe understanding the law taught them so that they can go out and teach the others. Oh, we call it discipleship. Isn't that interesting? The sacrificial system in chapter 10, which we won't get to tonight, was carried on and with careful attention to perform it as it was written in the law. Quote, then there was a, uh, their deep concern to abide by God's revealed will that they took a curse and an oath to walk in God's law on chapter 10, verse 20, 29. He said, we will you know, be a curse upon us if we don't walk in the law of God. And so they did that to themselves. They made a commitment. They made a vow before the Lord. And in chapter 13, verse 1, when the marriage reforms were carried, uh, carried out, which we saw in Ezra last week, and acted in accordance with that which was written or read in the book of Moses, because it even says it in there. They did what the book of Moses said by getting rid of the heathen wives that they took during this time right in here, during the captivity, especially those that were left in Jerusalem that didn't get deported. Isn't that cool? Let me ask you a question. So I want to try to get you guys to go in here. Right here in this little spot, they read the law of God in what we would call nowadays in some ways a revival broke out. Why? Why do you think? Exactly. Hmm? Desperation. Okay. Very good. They recognize the truth. No, I don't have an answer I'm going to give you. I just want to know. <laughs> Why is the word of God important? Why did it so important? I mean, when they heard it, they started to cry. Now, we can get really super spiritual, which is nothing wrong with that, and say it was the presence of God, and as they heard it, you know, the presence of God fell on them. Yeah, I think that's a good portion of it. But what else, what else would you think? They recognized their sins. You think so? Yeah. The promises. Yeah, they're sin because what did it say? They carried out the reform to get rid of the heathen wives, you know, like God told them to. He said, don't marry. Don't marry outside your people. Anything else? What do you think about this? <laughs> Come on, Mary. I'm baiting you. I'm baiting you. <laughs> Okay, talk to me. Isaiah. Okay. So what is that saying, Mary? Amen. Go on, pre if I had a white hanky, I'd wave it. Go on, girl. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So what does it have? It has authority, doesn't it? Okay. Turn with me. Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen. These are scriptures you all know, but we're going to go through them a little bit. And those of you have the notes already, you know, you're cheating. So here we go, <laughs> which is good. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 
Hmm? Come on, say it. Go ahead. Excellent. Excellent. Now we'll read it from the New American Standard. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Meaning this, inspired, which I, I love. And when, as I wrote this down in the notes tonight, you know, because there's, there's a couple of, you know, the, the main points where it says authority in scripture, and we'll see, in, you know, several others. Those came from Wayne Grudem in his, in his uh, systematic theology. But the rest of it, I just started going through it. And it's interesting because inspire means God breathed. God breathed. That meant God spoke. It's interesting because, you know, what did Jesus do in, in uh, Luke chapter 4 when he, was on the, when he was out in the wilderness and the enemy came to him? Anybody remember? He quoted scripture. He quote, here's the word quoting the word. Here's the writer of the word quoting the word, which is interesting. And he, it's God breathed. It means God literally spoke it. He breathed it out. Then it says it's profitable, which means it's advantageous, which means it's useful. Let's look at it again. All scripture is inspired or God breathed and profitable, which means useful. Then it says for teaching. Now it's interesting. If you look at it, you can look it up later on. Romans chapter 3, verse 2. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, it says that the word of God is called the oracles of God. The very oracles, the things that God speaks, the things that God wants us to know. So here's this group standing there in the hot sun from morning to midday, and they're reading the law of God, the Old Testament, the law out of the Old Testament, and they're beginning to weep. Because I personally believe, yes, it was you know, they, they were hungry for it. Yes, they were, they were ready for it. Yes, you know, the presence of God was there. But like you said, there was a recognition of the very authority of what they were listening to. This is the thing that goes all the way back to when Moses came down from the mountain and he handed these tablets. He said, this is the law of God. And the people remember these. There's all kinds of memories of things they've been taught, things they've heard all through the years. And all of a sudden, they were hungry. They've been without the word of God. They've been without all this, you know, his instruction. They've been feeling alone. They were feeling attacked, desperate, you know, depressed, all these things. Because we saw that at the beginning when um, Nehemiah said, I want to go back because the people are in disarray. They're hurting. So they're hungry. It says for teaching. Teaching is interesting because it means not just teaching in the sense of like I'm doing right here. It means also teaching with warning. You know, we love the nice teaching, the motivational stuff, but when it comes down to things where it says, like, you know, anyone that can, goes on and continues to sin does not know God, you know, people get upset with that today. These guys in the Old Testament, they just said it, and it's like, deal with it, guys. Because there's a warning when we hear the word of God, but even that warning, they sense the very care and love of God for his people in the midst of it. Even when he was saying, if you guys don't do this, I'll send you back into captivity. And we saw that up here. So there's warning. It says for teaching, as we saw with warning. Then it says to reprove. That means to refute as well as convict. And correction. It says it's good for, profitable for correction. This is, this is really cool. When, when someone is... You ever seen somebody that's depressed? Do they walk most of the time straight up? Well, sometimes they do, but in most cases they're kind of just slouched, you know, and they're like this, or they're hurting in some way, and they come in and you go, how you doing? I'm all right, I'm all right. But if they were feeling good, they was more straight, more confident. Yeah, doing great, doing This here means, it's really cool, to correct means to take, is if I, you know, if I had, Chris, come here for a second. Kind of slouch a little bit. Yeah, you know, give me, yeah, there you go. That's good. It means this. It means to straighten him up and put his head up. That's what that word means. Okay? <laughs> I can see. Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, buddy. That's what it means. It means to take someone and straighten them up. 
And we think, you know, it's like your mom ever looking at you and go, you better straighten up, boy. Okay? Well, that's not quite what this means. It means for those that are downcast, those that are hurting, to straighten them up. It can mean that, but in the context, it's not quite that way. It just means to get them going again. Then it means training in righteousness. It means to train in godly behavior. Now turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Chapter 1. Verse 20. You know this one, Rich? <laughs> I'm putting him on the spot. He's probably going to go, no, you had to ask me that one, right? It says this, verse 20. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Prophecy of Scripture, meaning all of Scripture. Now you're going, wait a minute, is he talking about Old Testament? Yes, initially he's talking about Old Testament. But if you look in the context of the book, turn with me real quick and go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, look at verse 15. Let's go to 14. Therefore, chapter 3 of 2 Peter, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of the Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, and that's who we know who he is, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. So also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the, up to, uh, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also, watch this, the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction." Peter equated what Paul wrote with the Old Testament. He was saying that Paul's writings were scripture. He believed that they were from God, God breathed. So go back to chapter one, verse 20, and look at this again. No prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. The Greek word for interpretation has the idea of loosing, saying that no scripture is a result of any human being privately untying and loosing the truth. Peter's point is not so much about how to interpret scripture, but rather how scripture originated and what its source was. Meaning this, it's not something that I just throw out there. It's not something I just take and make it my own. You don't untie it that way and loose whatever you want. No, no, no. God wrote it specifically and said exactly what he wanted to say. And it's not of human will. Look at verse, uh, verse 20, 21. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but by men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Human will as the scripture is not of human origin. It is therefore not the result of a human will. It says that they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Grammatically, this means that they were continually carried or borne along by the Spirit of God. So there's an authority with Scripture. So when Nehemiah read this word, him and Ezra, actually Ezra read it, and Nehemiah and all of them were standing there, and the people began to weep, they understood the authority of God's word. It said that they bowed down to the ground. When was the last time we ever felt that humbled when we heard the word of God read? That's not a conviction. That's not a, like, I'm saying that to myself too. I really miss, you know, because I remember when I got saved back in the 70s, our pastor, Pastor uh, Dr. Horton, he, when he would read on Sunday morning when he would stand up to start preaching, he'd go, can we stand for the reading of God's word? There was this honor that was given as we, the word was read. And then he would pray and he'd say amen, he may be seated, and then he would start his message. You know, that's considered like old-fashioned. I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to do it, but I think we need to bring back a little bit of that, that honor, you know, for the Word of God. So, uh, and that wasn't a trying to get that. That just popped into my head as we were doing this. So the authority of Scripture is one thing. The second thing is the clarity of the Scripture. The Bible is written in such a way that its teachings are able to be understood by all who will read it, seeking God's help, and being willing to follow it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to flip all the way back into the New Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
We read this when we were looking at Deuteronomy. Look at verse 6 and 7. Chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. These words which I, am com- uh, which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. There's a clarity meaning this. Again, it's written in such a way that his teachings are able to be understood by all who will read it seeking God's help. What did Ezra and Nehemiah do and the Levites? They explained it. Or as, as Ricky Ricardo said, they, they explained it. Okay? They explained it to Lucy, meaning what? They, it was easy to understand. When they read it, and if there was any confusion, they would explain it. And they was like, oh, yeah. Anyone can understand the word of God if we want to. Watch this. It says, it shall be on your heart. Look again. These words which I command you today, today shall be on your heart. Obedience to God's law was not to be a form of legalism, but a response based on love and understanding. That's why he says, these shall be on your heart. The heart was considered the seat of all the emotions in Jewish thought. The heart and the mind were, were basically one. They were together. There was very little distance between those in Jewish thought. And so the heart was the seat of all the emotions. So when you see these shall be on your heart, it's not saying in legalism because if legalism is not in your heart, you're just doing it. It's just, yeah, okay, I got to do this to win God's love. No, because I love him, I have these things in my heart and I will obey. That's the beauty of it. Mm hmm. Hear, O Israel, yeah, the Shema. Or Shema, Shema, however you want to say it. Look at Jeremiah 31, 33. Turn with me to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with uh, the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart, and I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Let's read that again. That's a great verse. Verse 33. But this is a covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put the law within them and on their heart. I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You know, it's interesting because it says, I will put their law, my law in their heart. In the Hebrew, that means that God, God is doing the, the work, doing the action. He's the one that's putting it in. They're not doing it themselves. He's putting it in. And if you remember, in Ephesians, it says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus which means it's God's work. He who began a good work in you shall complete it. It's his work. And he said, look, as they're listening, God is putting this word again into the hearts of the Jewish people. It's his hand that's doing that surgery. Where's that coming from? Hebrews chapter 4, right? About the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, sharper than a surgical instrument. It can cut, it can divide. He's doing the surgery and putting this word in their heart because of his promises all through this stuff, all even back into Egypt and all the way through the kingdom, all the way, the wilderness, the kingdom. When it divides, he's still taking care of them and all the way through the captivity again. And he says right here, let me read the word to you and watch what I can do. And they read it, and they take those promises back in. I mean, this, ah, this is incredible. And he said, look back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and, to your, uh, and talk of them when you sit on, in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as 
frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What does this mean? God's law, God's word is to be the subject of the conversation both inside the home and outside from our rising to our resting. God's word should be that, should be that, that conversation piece. I told you that there was a young adult group that I was involved in that I met Denise in. And for a while, we were trying to memorize scripture and we made a, a, a little vow with each other that for a short period of time, we would say very little if it wasn't scripture to each other. And it was, you talking about, you know, like today's word awkward, you know, how do you say, let's go to Burger King with the scripture? <laughs> you know, but we tried to just, and what we would do is we would say, like, um, if I was memorizing uh, John 3, 16, I would walk up to Walker and I would go, for God so loved the world that that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. And we would finish it together. So we would, fig- so we would go, oh, that's all right. You know, we go, oh, good job. And if, you know, they couldn't finish it, we, you know, the other person finish it, and we go, learn it. Next week, I'll hit you with it again. Oh, okay, great. And then we see each other again. For God so loved the world. And he would say, on and on. And then the last person would have to say the reference, John three sixteen, And it was just a way that we were, you know, nobody, we didn't read it anymore. We just started trying to figure out how to memorize Scripture that way. You know, and it was speaking the Word in our conversations would be the Word of God more than it would be anything else because we were trying to learn and get the word of God into our heart in that way. So those conversations, on and on and on. There was the necessity of scripture. Okay, we saw the authority, the clarity, the necessity of scripture. The Bible is necessary for knowledge of the gospel and maintaining spiritual life and certain knowledge of God's will. Look at Matthew 4.4 4 real quick. Look what Jesus said. This is what we're talking about. It's also in Luke chapter 4. Let's start in verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Explain that one, (laughs) y'all. We know we had to go through it. But we say, oh, the devil's jumping on me. This can't be God's will. How do you know? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. So I think it's what, First Peter, that says, don't be surprised by the, uh, the trials, the many trials that you face, for it's the testing of your faith that produces perseverance. And Jesus had to, because remember what happened in the garden? Being with Adam, the first Adam, and Jesus called the second Adam, he had to withstand this. So, but look what it says. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Most of us would become hangry. <laughs> and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What do you think he's saying there? (laughs) Yeah. What else? If you got a a Bible with references in the border somewhere, look for that verse and it should say Deuteronomy 8.3 by it. Someone look up Deuteronomy 8.3 and tell me what it says. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 8.3, what does it say? Yeah. 
There we go. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, well, I, who knows? You pro- if, if you've been here long enough, you've heard me say this. What is it when he says, when he said to Satan, he said, it is written. What does that literally mean? <laughs> is that from my wife in the back back there? <laughs> I see that hand. It stands written is what it literally says. That means it's never going to change. It's not just it's written, someone wrote it down. It means it stands written. I always remember from the, uh, one of my favorite movies besides, you know, Ben-Hur is the, is the uh, Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner. And Yul Brynner had that voice as Pharaoh. And he goes, so let it be written, so let it be done. You know, and every time I see it as written, I always remember Yul Brynner as Jesus or something, you know, going, so let it be written, so let it be done. Because it's exactly what it means. It's written, it's done, and it will forever stand this. So ever, forever and ever, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Which means that God's so concerned, not just with our physical, but with our spiritual. And in the word of God, we see he provides for our physical, and he also, through the word of God, provides for our spiritual. Okay? So there's... The necessity of Scripture. You can read later on 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, because it just talks about, you know, the grass will wither and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord will stand forever because it stands written. And then there's the sufficiency of Scripture, and we're, and we're just about done. Scripture contains all the words of God he intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history, and it now contains everything we need God to tell us for salvation, for trusting him perfectly and for obeying him perfectly. Deuteronomy 29, 29. This is that verse that is used many times in the prophetic when we don't understand stuff. And that's good. It does apply, but the context is a little different. Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. And we forget that last part many times when we quote it prophetically that, you know, well, you know, what does that mean? I don't know, secret things belong to God, but what we told you belong to you. You know, well, yeah, that's true. But the context is talking about God's law. God does not require us to believe anything about himself or his redemptive work that is not found in Scripture. Deuteronomy 29, 20 says, that, you know, let's read it again. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us. Revealed means this, God's law with all of its promises and warnings, all the things that God gives us in his word. And then it says the secret things belong to God. Hidden things can refer to the specific way in which God will carry out his will in the future. Meaning this, how is God going to do this? How is God going to do that? Every one of us have asked those questions. How is God going to make this thing happen? Well, that's his. That's the secret thing. But the thing is, is that he said, I will do this. How he does it is up to him. There's times he reveals it to us. And after it happens, we go, oh. But before that, we have no idea what he's going to do. And we've got to remember that, that God's word gives us everything we need. Second Peter, for life and godliness. That means living and walking in his commandments. He's given it all to us, and he's given it to us in Christ and through his word. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. So Nehemiah was concerned with the city of God. He wanted to see the city protected and rebuilt. Ezra wanted the temple rebuilt. And together with all the people and the remnant that were left there and the ones that came back when they returned, they put Jerusalem back together. Now, not next week, but the week after that, we're going to look at Esther. Esther happened right here during, in between the first and second deportation. A beautiful book of Esther happened right there, which is really neat, and I can't wait to dig into that one. But again, When we finally get to the very end of Malachi, we're going to see that God sets it all up 
for the entrance of the king. He is so cool about that. And he left the Old Testament with that open. He said, I'm going to send Elijah, and he's going to usher in the king. And then all of a sudden, John the Baptist dressed like Elijah in the spirit and calling of Elijah. Not the spirit of Elijah, you know, like reincarnated in him. That's not it. I had a guy tell me that in the hospital one time. I was sharing a room with him. And he goes, reincarnation's in the Bible. And he tried to prove it out of John. And he goes, so what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and he goes, he really went, uh-oh. I said, and we're both here, right? And he goes, yeah. I said, you're a captive audience. Let's go. <laughs> 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 and for two days, he was with me, and it was great. And we had some great conversations. I got to pray for him, and it was, it was a blast. It was a blast. He never, never came to Christ that I know, but I, with all of what he heard, he had to somewhere along the years. He come to Jesus, and I'm praying he does. But in between here, John the Baptist shows up, and that is the last of the Old Testament prophets. He came in that authority and that way to usher in Christ. And when he did, as we, saw, we said last week, then in chapter 3, verse 33, he says, Now he, meaning Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. i got to back off because the king is here. He's going to do his work. I did my job. And that's why when he was beheaded that Jesus said no greater person was ever born by woman than John the Baptist. Because that was his job, was to usher in and make you know, the king, make way the path for him. Think about that. That was his only purpose, nothing else. A pretty good purpose, right? Pretty rough way to die. He got beheaded, you know, but other than that, can you think about it? I mean, that was it. And that's why Jesus said no one, it was the greatest one born was John the Baptist. That's cool. That's cool. I can't wait. He's one of the ones I can't wait to meet. So there we go. So we're putting the timeline together. We good? Okay, it's 8.20. We got 10 minutes.